at a good friend of mine, Nancy Dickerson, who has worked extensively in the area of crisis intervention in schools with various school personnel, including bus drivers, teachers, and administrators. And Nancy is going to be presenting a model that she'll tell us about of children's needs. Nancy Dickerson. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, it's a pleasure um, helping out a chance to talk about something that I really love. Um, I've worked in uh, centers for uh, children with emotional disturbance for about 15 years, and over time, uh, working with children in crisis, I developed a model that um, looks a little bit like Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, but it is um, what I'm calling the basic needs of children. And uh, we're going to go through this and just kind of identify these needs and talk about how they get met or don't get met by the schools. And I use this model for training staff so that they have just the framework for understanding children who are misbehaving or children who are really looking like they are in trouble. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, what this is is a hierarchy, kind of like the food pyramid, where you start at the bottom and work up. And um, what we're working up towards is to have a successful child. And so we'll put success up here because that's what we're aiming for. This framework is really helpful because I think what it shows is that kids have certain needs that really need to be in place before they can move up to the next step. Uh, most people have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and he generally starts with basic biological needs. I work a lot with animals, um, I, horses and, and cats and dogs and, and what I find is that uh, children have a lot of the same kinds of instinctual needs and when, when I um, started to do this, I, I thought about biological needs down here and realized that the first thing that needs to be in place for children is actually safety. And to illustrate this, I use the example of animals who are out in the field grazing. And um, I often use the, the movie Bambi, where all the, the deer are out there with their heads down and they're grazing in the sun. And suddenly they realize there's a predator. And what happens is the heads go up, the ears go up, and there's a moment of flight or fight. And most animals will flee if they can. And it's the same thing with children. Um, I work a lot with children who tend to run away from things that they're afraid of or immediately get into a fighting stance. So there's that flight or fight response for children um, if they don't feel safe. So safety can take a number of forms for kids. Um, it's going to be small down here. But there's the physical safety, which needs to come first, obviously. If children don't feel safe, they are not going to be able to settle down and learn in a classroom. Uh, and this physical safety can be um, compromised, certainly at home, but also occasionally in schools. Uh, there's also emotional safety. And uh, often, children do not feel emotionally safe around their peers, sometimes around teachers, and a lot of times around the adults that they live with. Okay, so these are the things that I check out when I see a child in crisis. The third thing that I'm going to put in here in terms of safety, because people ask, what about parents, is that I think that there's a need for supervision, which guarantees, or is supposed to guarantee, children's safety. And a lot of times, I see in schools that the supervision is lacking. Uh, I can remember a kid I counseled a long time ago, I'll try not to get into too many stories, but I counseled a child who was having a real tough time because every time he went into the locker room he was beat up by the, by the rest of the boys. And it was a boy thing around fifth or sixth grade and I went and approached the teacher of the gym class and he said, I can't supervise the locker room. Well, and the problem continued and probably continues to this day, that these are places that have less than, less than adequate supervision. Buses, um, transition times, playground, cafeteria, those kinds of things. Okay, so these are the places where safety may be compromised for kids in schools. The next step would be biological needs. And that includes the basic food, water, shelter, 
But it also includes things like sleep. And I put sleep down as a basic biological need. I, we often see kids whose sleep is compromised. If a child comes in and he's sleeping in the morning, a young child, not a high schooler, but, but younger children, if they're sleeping in school, their safety is being compromised. They're not able to sleep. They're either not having the supervision and safety to get sleep or something else is going on that's keeping them up and worried. <laughs> so I often check on what their sleep needs are. And it creates some problems in school, obviously, for children who need to sleep. And the question is, we can, can we let them sleep in school? It comes up quite a bit. Uh, and my answer is, if a child needs sleep, it's a basic biological need. We may need to give them a 20-minute nap for them to go on in their day. Other than, otherwise, there's a crisis anyway. <coughs> um, another one is medications. I'll just put down medical care. Because certain, certain times, medical, medical concerns get in the way. We have children who come in and they are sick and they're not being taken care of or taken to a doctor, toothaches, those kinds of things that I need to check out occasionally. And there are children who are on medications that need to take them, haven't taken them, are out of them at home, those kinds of things that I check out with kids. After biological needs, um, I put something in its own category, although I believe it is a basic biological need. And that is touch. I'll put it down here as caring touch, because certainly there are touches that can be harmful to children. But children need caring touch, and I see this all the time at work. My work is very physical with children. I am always letting them know that I'm there for them. It grounds them physically. I have a little role because it makes people crazy in the schools when they talk about touching children. I say armpits up. Everything else is fair game, everything above the armpits. So I'll touch a child on the arm or on the back of the shoulders and rub their head if they let me. And generally, they really respond well to this caring touch. When you think about children and touch as a basic need, you think about failure to thrive and the research that was done on premature babies who did not get touched and were put in incubators, and they were given all of their basic biological needs but not touch, and we discovered that children would often die from lack of exposure to human warmth. So I make sure that I provide this for children who have not had enough of it. Um, the next, oh, and, and I also wanted to put in here, I think that another thing that is a basic biological need is exercise and movement. I've seen a lot of kids who do not are not allowed to move around or don't have the um, access to places to exercise, and it tends to be a problem for them when they get into a classroom and are asked to sit because they're fidgety and need to work off energy. And also, proper exercise and development for children if they're allowed to explore their world and use equipment and move around and, and get out and, and walk, crawl, walk, run, skip, hop, all those things that are developmentally appropriate tend to do better when they actually sit down and try to learn fine motor movement, reading skills, math skills, etc. So uh, sometimes this gets overlooked in curriculum, you know, that children need some, some time to move and stretch. We are seeing that people are putting yoga exercises into their classrooms to help children learn to, um, you know, use short, small space and short time, but get a little bit of movement in. Okay. These three things are the base for children to develop physically. We move on to uh, a, a little bit higher up the ladder here. Uh, after care and touch, what I have down here is kind words. Working with children, this would, this would include encouragement, and praise. Many of my children come in and they, uh, they make a small mistake and they hit their head and call themselves stupid. It's very discouraging because I know that that's what they hear, um, terrible things that they hear about themselves from, from people at home or, or children at school and they tend to integrate that into their thought about themselves. So I'm constantly trying to counter that with encouragement and praise, and um, children need it. Uh, I consider that one of their basic needs for success. 
The next thing that is on this list is creative play. When you think about, we're right next door to a daycare and I'm hearing the children's voices and I'm thinking about all the things that they can come up with, even as young children, to play with. It doesn't take much, it doesn't take a lot of money to play creatively. This is an empty boardroom, but I've had children sitting in empty rooms like this who have created whole worlds of play, just moving the chairs around and hiding under the tables and, uh, you know. Um, it's something that children do naturally. It's very difficult to watch children who are sitting in front of a television all day long or classroom teachers who put a, a movie on because they are not allowed the time to use their brains to be creative. Um, and it's something that they will do instinctively when they're by themselves. The next thing here is peers. Children need other children and they search out and look for children in their age group. I live across the street from an elementary school and I hear the children come out onto the playground at around noon and it's this screaming and greeting and grouping that they do that's really fun to watch. And it's difficult now for children who can't find peers. So a lot of times children are in crisis because they're ostracized or kept out of, of peer groups. And they are really looking to find ways to belong to a group. So the need here is the need to belong. If they can't get it, they really do find difficulty right again to, it brings them right back again to meeting this basic need of safety because children don't feel safe if they're ostracized from a group. And a lot of creative play initially may happen when you're, in, when you're in an individual situation, but children together come up with all sorts of creative play that gets into rules, social rules, um, and, and they learn a lot from each other, which is, which is very interesting. <coughs> I, um, we now have two more before we reach success, and I'm sure that there are a lot of things that, that we could put in here and tuck in, but these are the things that I think that definitely are, are necessary for this framework to get to success. The next one I will call a safe, supportive, learning environment. Now, this could be a school, and sometimes schools are safe and supportive, and there are times that children find them not to be safe and supportive in terms of uh, peer interactions or in terms of their interactions with teachers or principals or administrators um, or in terms of lack of supervision. There are a lot of reasons that uh, students would not find a school safe or supportive. The approach that adults use can either be supportive or non-supportive depending on the situation for children and uh, what kind of a punishment model is used if they're in trouble, right? So, trying to create a safe, supportive learning environment is a difficult task. Children often find it outside of schools where they find a trusted mentor <coughs> or a Boy Scout troop or, or a church group or some other, some other, or even a neighborhood where they are learning skills um, that, that interest them in, in a safe way. Um, when children are not feeling safe, they don't learn. Um, I think I, I left this out, but I use the example often of if you're sitting down at dinner and the family is eating and the fire alarm goes off, you don't say, okay kids, let's finish our dinner and take a nap and learn and do our homework before we leave the building. No, safety always comes first. So at any point in time here, if there is a safety need not being met, these things don't happen. Um, the, the last one on here is challenges. Once you're in that safe, supportive learning environment, if people are giving you challenges that meet your abilities, then you are headed for success. <clears throat> Children do need these challenges so that they are asked to do things that are, that are at that level. We have children in, in school classrooms with learning disabilities who get put down with younger children. And they're frustrated because they don't feel like they're being challenged enough. Sometimes they're giving work at a first grade level and they're a fourth grade student. And they refuse to do it. Even though it may be at their learning level, it's, they don't see the challenge in it. Um, so they need to be given challenges that meet their, their social needs as well as their academic needs. And then hopefully that they, they need to be able to feel success to be able to build on to the next success. 
Okay, so children who uh, do not feel the success and are, not, are given challenges that are perhaps too, too hard for them and don't feel the success end up feeling that failure and refuse to continue to try. All right? So when you look at these basic needs, I kind of group them here in these, this bottom three as physical development. Um, the next three as kind of social development, social and emotional development. And the next three is academic. So I'll tell you, since I don't have an audience here today, I'll tell you what a lot of times the questions are when I reach this point. Um, and when we look at this, it looks a little bit like an iceberg. And what you see is the tip floating uh, up here. And I can draw a line right around here that says, wow, you know, all of this stuff underneath here needs to really be in place before a child gets to school. So when a child comes into school, and this is all you have to work with here, you provide them a safe, supportive learning environment, you provide them with challenges that are at their level, and you hope that they can be successful. When children struggle up in this area, it's generally because these needs down here are still not being met. And the question is, how do we meet these needs? We're not at home with these children. We can't go back and provide them with caring touch when they were babies or kind words when they go home. Um, and I guess my work with children, I've often called it kind of reparenting or kind of shoring up. And um, our job is to just try and head for, for providing the safety and the needs where we can to help them get to the point where they can be more successful in school. Bill's giving me the sign that I think I've used up my time, and I hope that this can be helpful. And I always have a lot more to say, but uh, I, I, I hope this can be helpful for you. Thank you. I can see we're going to get lots of discussion, Nancy, on this model that you presented. And I think it makes so much sense. It's also built on good research that you refer to periodically. I can't thank you enough for making this presentation and I'm sure people are going to benefit from it, and especially the children.